Please help me in welcoming Dr. Betts. Thank you, Dr. Betts. Good afternoon, everyone. See, Dr. Betts took all the pressure off me because he literally said the most important thing I could possibly say in the next hour and a half, which is your session code. Um, I've been with you all day, so I dwell pretty much exactly how you feel. Your brains are full. Your stomachs are empty. The coffee's gone. It's been a, pretty, it's been a busy day, and I, I, I feel your pain from that standpoint. But if you'll just indulge me for just another hour and a half or so, um, we'll walk you through um, one final presentation, one final case. And I think the good news is you've already met our patient, so there's a lot of background that, you've already, that you're already aware of. And um, so these are my relevant uh, disclosures that are there for you. Um, they're also in the handout. Um, these are the learning objectives, and for the interest of time, um, I won't really dive into these, but we're basically going to be covering a lot of acute care cardiovascular topics um, for a patient who you've already been introduced to. And other than the fact that um, the premise is now we're um, in an academic medical center um, practicing an inpatient um, cardiovascular me uh, medicine therapy, for the most part your goals and objectives are what they are on a daily basis, which is really to provide the best pharmacotherapy you can for the patients that you manage. So that isn't that much of a, a stretch. And seeing how there's, we still have a pretty full house, um, I'd say that you guys already have the gold stars for the day, so for being here and sticking around for the entire day. And so you've already met our patient. So BV um, was the primary prevention case. And um, unfortunately for BV, um, he's now 57 years old, and we meet him again as he is coming in with um, crushing substernal chest pain that he rates as 10 out of 10 that wakes him up from sleep. And so he calls um, 911 and an ambulance arrives and during the time they start to manage him and work him up, they bring him into the ambulance, they give him a couple tablets of nitroglycerin sublingually, they have him chew some baby aspirin, so he gets 324 milligrams of aspirin. And based on his chest pains, they do an initial ECG which shows ST elevations and now they're moving him on and bringing him to the emergency department. You're already aware of his past medical history. Uh, the fact that he has hypertension, prediabetes, dyslipidemia, stage 2 CKD. His, his medications, again, you're already familiar with from our presentation this morning. He's on a low-dose aspirin, chlorthalidone, lisinopril, amlodipine, um, a moderate-intensity statin, and metformin. Now, as he presents to us in the emergency room, you'll see that a, a very rapid physical exam is obtained. He has mild inspiratory and expiratory crackles about a quarter of the way up both bases with a little trace pitle edema, both lower extremities. And then right along the same time, we obtain a 12-lead ECG, which is concerning for myocardial ischemia. He has ST elevations in leads V3 and V4, so we have two consecutive or two contiguous leads with ST elevations. And this area of the heart is a very important area of the heart for most patients. It represents LAD territory. Um, that isn't going to be on your exam, but just to kind of put things into perspective. But based on the fact that we have um, a hot LAD lesion, it's not surprising that we have positive cardiac biomarkers. And so we have a code STEMI that's obtained. Here's the rest of his Chem 7. But really, you know, the main focus here is that we have a patient presenting early with an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction who's already declared himself based on positive biomarkers. And so with that... I'll pose my first question, which is, which of the following represents the best initial anticoagulant pharmacotherapy for this patient? Would it be infractionated heparin, be anoxaparin, be fondaparinux, or bivalrudin? Okay, sponsors are coming in nicely, that's good. You're helping me help you get out of here on time, that's perfect. Okay, so the majority said on fractionated heparin, so I have a lot of convincing that I have to do, because I will say that based on the overall totality of the evidence, the best answer here is bivalrudin. So let me walk you through why I thought bivalrudin was the best choice. And so first what I'm going to try to do for at least the initial questions is I'll, I'll kind of introduce the guideline level statements and then I'll bring you into the clinical trial evidence which may help kind of delineate where the guidelines um, don't provide as much detail or um, specific, as specific recommendations as we need to make in clinical practice. And so, as you'll see here, this is now the 2013 um, ST Elevation uh, MI guidelines or the STEMI guidelines. So these were recently updated. 
And you'll see that unfractionated heparin, either with or without a 2B3A inhibitor, has a class 1C recommendation, whereas bivalrutin has a slightly higher class 1B recommendation. That's part of the story. That's not the entire story, but that's part of the story as to why I think bivalrutin would be a better choice. Um, in patients who are at high risk for bleeding, bivalrutin as monotherapy would be preferred. A softer recommendation based on the lack of overall clinical trials, there's one or two, so not three, four, five clinical trials. And then fondaparinux uh, should not be used as initial pharmacotherapy or initial anticoagulant therapy for PCI. Um, and that is because in the two studies where, where fondaparinux has been uh, evaluated in acute coronary syndromes, in patients undergoing PCI, there's a, a very high risk, or at least a high risk in the realm of PCI, a high risk of catheter-related thrombosis, which is one of the major catastrophic events that can happen to a patient undergoing PCI. And so if you're going to use fondaparinux up front, during the actual PCI, you have to supplement fondaparinux with unfractionated heparin. So you have to use two anticoagulants. So that's where this recommendation comes from. Um, the risk of catheter thrombosis is anywhere from 0.6 to 1% based on the clinical trials. If you work in an area that does um, a lot of PCI, so for example, in my institution, we would probably have about one episode per week based on the number of PCIs that we would do. So 0.6 to 1% may seem like a small number, but if you think about the number of cases you may be doing, one a week would be an, ex uh, an unacceptably high number. The guidelines don't refer to anoxaparin. Now, many didn't pick anoxaparin. The overall data with anoxaparin suggests that it has no advantage over unfractionated heparin for STEMI, but with an increased risk of bleeding. And there's a little more um, thought that needs to be taken into account when using anoxaparin. You need to know the timing of the anoxaparin prior to PCI. There's about an eight-hour window where it's okay to use or continue to use your, um, to go to PCI without supplemental anticoagulant therapy. If it's after eight hours, you need to rebolus or redose with anoxaparin, so it's a little more cumbersome than using, and that's kind of counterintuitive. Usually we think of anoxaparin as easier than unfractionated heparin. In the world of PCI, that's actually not the case. It can actually be a little more complicated. Now, having said that, what I'll walk you through is, is the main clinical trial um, that led to the use of bivalrutin um, in PCI. There's actually two studies. Uh, one was the ACUITY trial, which was published in 2006. That was non-ST segment elevation MI, unstable angina. It doesn't fit our patient. This is the Horizons AMA tri AMI trial, which does fit our patient um, because it's a STEMI trial. So a little under 3,600 patients, around 3,600 patients with ST segment elevation MI who are receiving dual antiplatelet therapy were randomized to receive unfractionated heparin with a 2B3A inhibitor versus bivalrutin alone, and then provisional 2B3A. This is going to be allowed in any trial where PCI is conducted because you have to account for the fact that there can be complications during the case, and the majority of complications are an antiplatelet-driven process. So 2B3A inhibitors provisionally are kind of a standard of care in any PCI-driven trial to minimize the risk of complications that can take place during PCI. There is also a stent component to that, but that really doesn't impact us at this point in time, um, but that was in the trial as well. And so what you'll see here is that overall, with regards to the primary endpoint, there was a net clinical benefit that favored bivalrutin compared to heparin 2B3A, which was predominantly driven by a reduction in major bleeding and the ischemic endpoints, as I've listed here for you, that may be difficult to read, um, the ischemic endpoints were all-cause death, uh, myocardial reinfarction, target vessel ischemia, or revascularization, or stroke. So those are more of the ischemic endpoints. You'll see there is no difference between bivalve monotherapy versus uh, unfractionated heparin with the 2B3 inhibitor, whereas there was a reduction in major bleeding, and that gives us a reduction in the overall net clinical benefit, which is basically this endpoint plus this endpoint. 